Let's return to This Week in America. Here's your host, Rick Bratton. Welcome back, everybody. Coast to Coast, This Week in America. Nancy Hussey never planned to author a book until she discovered her daughter's many teen diaries, which were disguised as school notebooks, clearly not intended to be read by mom. But mom soon became engrossed in the unknown and intimate details of Sarah's first love and a teen melodrama that she knew would keep readers guessing. She also believed that Sarah's optimism, ability to live her joyful moments to the fullest, would be an inspiration for all adolescents and young adults striving to reach their dreams. 20 years of writing about her clients gave Nancy the courage to write about her own daughter's battle for life. She left Sarah to share the affairs of her own heart. Nancy's narration, including humorous reaction to Sarah's teen angst, also interweaves the threads of everyone's hopes and fears for Sarah as they struggle again and again to deny the specter of her death. Nancy Hussey, author of the empowering and touching story, Dancing Like There's No Tomorrow, is our guest on This Week in America. Hi, Nancy. Welcome to the program. It's great to have you with us. Oh, it's nice to be here. It's nice to meet you. Thank you. It is the same here, and this is such an inspiring story. Looking forward to having the opportunity to to talk about it. The name of the book, again, is Dancing Like There's No Tomorrow. We'll give you information on where to buy the book as, as we go through the program. What inspired you to write this book? What was it about this story, what you discovered with the diaries, that you thought, okay, I need to share this because this could help other people? Exactly right. That is one of the main reasons I wanted to do it. Uh, I, they were so personal and they were so honest because she did not think anybody would ever read them. You know, she yes. had them hidden and... Uh, so you really got the feel of the true girl and in what she was going through. And um, you have really beautifully explained the beginning of all of this. And I was astonished that she was such a talented and even funny writer. I couldn't believe it. And there were poems, and you know, not everybody's nuts about poems, but these poems were the way she really got out her feelings. And uh, that was wonderful for, you know, a mom trying to understand what what it's like for her to go through this uh, ordeal. And it was a, a terrible ordeal. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I thought was interesting was she did hide them from me, but then I began to wonder, what was she being so private about? Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> and maybe there were things in here that I really needed to know. So I will tell you, I read and read and read. There were, uh, there were in, um, uh, notebooks, school notebooks. Uh, And on the top, it said math, and one said, you know, uh, another one, I think biology it was. And I don't know why I opened them, because I was about to throw everything away. I was just clearing things out. Uh, And I read both of those notebooks, the complete notebooks, um, right then. I just sat there and read them all. I don't know whether that answered your question, though. Did I well, leave yes. anything out? Yes, I, I can understand you're going through all of this. You're you're very moved by her writing and felt this would be a benefit to others, which it has been and will continue to be. And you talked about some of the things that she was she was private about, and that had, had captured your attention. What is it that that Sarah is writing about? Uh, talk about the, the the diagnosis with leukemia. How old was Sarah when she was first diagnosed? Well, she was nine. And uh, I, the, the diagnosis, um, excuse me, I'm looking down here about that, but I, I wanted to tell you something else about the privacy part of it yes. and then get yes. down here. Okay, great. As I realized uh, that Sarah was writing about um, the leukemia also, So it was a nightmare, and I just want to mention that, that part of the book 
the beginning part of the book is written by me, and it's about the things that happened in the hospital and how horrible it was and how difficult it was for her and, and that kind of thing. Uh, it's a, maybe a sad part of the book, but there were, you know, there were highlights. There were things that went well, um, and uh, she managed to get through it. Uh, and she was nine when she when she was diagnosed, and um, the odds were in favor for her to be, you know, for it to be a remission. We were hopeful she would respond to the chemotherapy. Um, and we really learned a lot about the disease. The family realized that, you know, most people don't even know what it's like to have leukemia and what things happen in a hospital. And I think that that is another reason why I wanted it to go out, because it was uh, it was amazing in terms of what you learned and in terms of what happened to her and how she handled it. Uh, it it really affected everybody in the family. Um, she was not writing anything then, so we really didn't know how she was feeling because she was not one to complain. So reading how she really felt about everything that was going on was great. Um, and we met a very, very important person, I will just mention this, uh, that really made everything a lot better. Uh, and I think that you uh, you may want to know what couple of the things were that went wrong. Yes, because uh, and you're very vivid about talking and very honest about talking about that. Share some of those nightmares, life-threatening nightmares in many cases that, that occurred while in the hospital. They really were life-threatening. The very first one was we got to the hospital, and of course, finding out that she had leukemia was very, very scary for all of us. And so we got to the hospital, and everybody was being very nice and charming, and we were introduced to the uh, the doctor who was going to take care of her. And uh, he was just, you know, telling her all about what was going to happen and making her feel a little bit better about the whole thing. And before we knew it, we had a new doctor, not him. And that was because when he gave the prescription for the first chemotherapy, if she had taken it, it would have killed her. Wow. This is the truth. And But the nurses were very aware of what the first dose was supposed to be, and therefore they gave her the correct dose. He was fired. He came and visited us and apologized for the whole thing, and um, it, he left. But he had one last thing to say, and that was, I'm sure everything will be great and you'll do very well as long as the chemotherapy doesn't kill you. <laughs> so okay. That was really not a very nice thing to say at the no, end of all of it. No. But it's not, it's something <sighs> I always remembered. Yes, and that wow, what a what a thing to, to to hear and words obviously that resonate to this day as as you're talking about it. It just uh, yeah, it's a frightening yeah. story. With us on the program is Nancy Hussey. That's H U S S E Y. The book is Dancing Like There's No Tomorrow. The book's available at the usual places. We'll direct you to Amazon if you go to our website thisweekinamerica.us. The video version of the program, you'll see the book cover. You'll see a picture of of Sarah on that book cover. Let's pick up the story when she finally begins to enter the world of, of healthy teenagers. What was that? What was that period like? Well, I will tell you that um, that is the really the greatest part of the story yes. because she then does get better, and she is now going into uh, her first year of high school, and uh, she still has uh, almost no hair on her head. And, uh, you know, she's nervous about, because she has missed almost two years of school. It was two years of chemotherapy. So she, she goes to school the first day, and that is when she begins writing her diary. So I kind of turn over, um, you know, to some of what she wrote about, what she planned to do with her life after suffering 
unbelievably, yes. and uh, what she hoped for her life. And she began writing about that, which was wonderful to read. She was a very determined girl. She always had been. She was somebody who, you know, she was not going to take no for an answer for anything. Um, she was going to really, really make sure that she never had anything like that happen to her again. So the most wonderful thing that happened was that I insisted because I could see she was still depressed. I insisted that she join the church choir, which my other daughter had gotten into because she was older, and she really, really liked it, or she could dance in the musicals that the, uh, <clears throat> that the uh, church actually performed musicals uh, and took them all over the country. And they were musicals that, you know, were so almost, <laughs> they were almost, um, I'm trying to think of the right word. They were not, they were definitely amateur, but they were very close to not being amateur <laughs> because they had wonderful costumes uh, made by people from the church. Oh, yes. uh, they had a band they had just anything you would have in a regular, you know, going to New York and going to a regular show. Yes. Uh, and they, these kids, maybe there would be 40 of them, would travel all over the country and to other countries, believe it or not. Other states, other countries, and they would, you know, they would dance and sing and they would become, they would bond with each other and it was just a wonderful, wonderful thing that happened in her life. And that is what she wanted to do more than anything. She wanted to do it for the four years. Uh, and I know I'm, I'm not giving you a chance to say much. Well, no, I'm fascinated <laughs> she by the story. She wanted to do story. it for the four years that, um, you know, of high school. And also pre-high school, she was allowed to dance in the home shows. Uh, underneath, you know, not out on the uh, stage, but underneath the stage, right. there were the kids that were finally going to end up the following year uh, dancing in the in the shows. And so this was her life. This life made her so 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 happy. And um, but she was so afraid of a relapse, and that's why it's called dancing like there's no tomorrow. And I'm going to let you say something now. <laughs> well, I love the title of that, Dancing Like There's No Tomorrow by Nancy Hussey. The book's available at, at Amazon. So she was able, after the uh, uh, remission, she was able to continue dancing, continue singing. What a remarkable experience that would be as you talk about uh, basically uh, going out of the country and performing the show as well. How about the, the relationship she had with, with Matt that you talk about in the book? How did that continue? Oh, that was lovely. But I want to say one more thing about what you just said. There were 700 people that they danced for more than once when they were traveling. Wow. And they also went to um, elderly homes and oh, yes. institutions to cheer people up there, too. I just wanted to mention that. Um, okay, ask me again. <laughs> well, yeah, the relationship she had with, with Matt. Uh, talk oh, about how okay. that how that yeah. that progressed during all of these all these months. Exactly. So it is a definitely a teenage drama. Uh, at this whole part is a teenage drama, and um, so one of her one of the things she planned to do with her life was get a boyfriend. <laughs> so she writes, "I want a boyfriend," <laughs> and so she was. Determined. She, it did occur to her that maybe it might be hard since she was wearing a wig, and you know because she was still you know re recovering. She yes. was in a re kind of a recovering stage, and so I, I remember when I read that I thought, you yeah, boy, she <laughs> really Sarah, uh, <laughs> excuse me, um, you know. And so she finally realized that it might not be so easy to get a boyfriend considering that almost everybody knew she had leukemia and, you know, so on. But she was determined. And there was one boy in the show, and that was Matt, who uh, she did fall for. He was dating somebody else. And uh, he eventually, uh, which is 
a lot of what the beginning is about, how that goes. At the same time, his best friend is the lead in beautiful handsome guy was and also a teenager was the lead in Jesus Christ Superstar oh, and he had okay. a voice he had the voice of a um, so there's two men here going on or young men um, so he had this voice that was so so beautiful and she just was crazy about him and his best friend was Matt and he he liked her I'm talking about Jesus he liked her, and they were good friends, um, but she wasn't quite in love with Matt as much as she was with him. So that becomes a drama, which I won't tell you any more about. Yeah, we can read all about that. This is fascinating as we read about Sarah's uh, life in the book Dancing Like There's No Tomorrow by Nancy Hussey. If you're Googling that, that's H-U-S-S-E-Y, book available at Amazon. And boy, time is going by so quickly. This is such a fascinating story that, that Nancy tells. And let's talk about uh, uh, after Matt and Jake leave for college, talk about what happens there because this is a, a very important part of Sarah's life as well at the time, isn't it? Uh, yes, it is. And um, she... She did miss them. And, you know, before I tell you about how, how that went, I would like to say that Matt turned out to be heaven sent. I, I almost felt like he was an angel, you know, yes. not, a, not a young teenager, teenage boy, because uh, she did relapse. And when she relapsed, he was at her side all the time. So I just wanted to mention that part before we go on to how she felt after they left. Um, so this was, and also when she relapsed, all the kids got together from, from, you know, the kids that were performing with her, got together and really supported her in a wonderful way. Uh, and she was part of the shows at that point, but she couldn't, you know, she couldn't dance. And uh, there was, you know, there was an episode where she was able, she was so ill uh, that the doctor didn't want her to go and do the show, anything in the show, because it was in uh, Boston. But he let her do it if she did not lose any more than two pounds. And so she had a little tiny part in it because they just wanted her to be able to be part of it. And uh, when she got up to do it, uh, we'll call, I'm going to call him Jesus. <laughs> because okay. that's yes. what he played and that's yes. what he was to her. Jesus was supposed to kind of be there with her and kind of hold her up. And that's what he did because she was so weak. But you know what? She was so happy to have him near her. <laughs> and meanwhile, Matt, is she's still a girlfriend of Matt's, um, that she, she was thrilled. <laughs> it didn't matter yes. that she had to go back to the hospital. It didn't matter, <laughs> you know, that we had to drive back and she was too sick to do anything else. She was very, very happy because she had, you know, something really, really nice happened to her that she was always fishing for. Did I at all answer your question? Yes, you did. Oh, There's no, so I many I personalities no. here and Sarah and what she goes through and her interactions with others. And I get the impression that, that humor helped, uh, helped everybody get through these, these, these tense times. Oh, absolutely. And these boys really knew how to make her laugh. And I was just looking over some of the things, but they were very silly. And they were constantly writing to her. They did write to her. Um, when she was going through that that relapse, um, they were writing very silly, silly things to her that were making her laugh and sometimes making her laugh hysterically. Uh, and I'm trying to think of what, what are the, one of the ones that I liked that I just wanted to read to you. Um, because let me look for it. Please do. And in the book, it. you've got Sarah's poems, and it's told in several voices, and it's really a touching, a touching story, Dancing Like There's No Tomorrow by Nancy Hussey. Uh, 
uh, Sarah's mom and uh, and our guest on the program. Yes, yes. And I probably don't, I'm looking at the time myself, and I really don't have time to read too much that she wrote herself. But believe me, this is what makes the story, is her story. Uh, I am somebody who just, you know, kind of makes remarks along the way, and they're, you know, in just little sentences of my yes. my opinions about what's going on. <laughs> And, uh, you know, the, uh, she was so, so happy, so, so happy when she finally had the boyfriend. And she has beautiful poems about them, you know, about her feelings. Unfortunately, as soon as they finally kissed, she relapsed. That was when she had her relapse. So the story goes on from there. And um, people who read it really loved the fact that there were two voices, mine and Sarah's. That adds and that, so much. So, so many people said that. Well, it adds so much, and it's a unique way to tell the story. As you say, you've got uh, her raw comments there and the, the talent exposed in, in writing and her perspective on life, and then you've got your mom comments that come in, and uh, all parents can relate to, to your comments as you read Actually, those. Right, you're right about that. And they were very funny and sometimes sarcastic. <laughs> As moms and dads are too from time to time. So it, that's what yes. makes it what makes it so so believable. Uh, just a, a minute or so left in the program, but you 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 talk about the voices of others in the book as well. This really is all encompassing, isn't it? In telling Sarah's story. Yes, it really is. There were many, many uh other people who, you know, talked to her and wrote to her uh, and they cared about her and that's you get to hear their voices too because those were also in the diaries she wrote down what they said and um, so you're hearing their voices also about how they felt about her and you know in the end it was a love story and it is also many other things many other things. Well, it's a lesson for all of us when we sense share, uh, Sarah's optimism, the ability to live joyful moments to the fullest. Sometimes we don't do that in life. They go by and we're on to something else because we're going 100 miles an hour. And you sort of, after reading Sarah and her attitude, it's like, you know, we should stop and enjoy each day as we go here. She gives all of us, I believe, uh, young and old, the sense that slow things down, enjoy life that comes at you. Uh, it is so oh, yeah. well written. Uh, you'll see Sarah's picture on the cover and the full story in Nancy's book, uh, Dancing Like There's No Tomorrow by Nancy Hussey. The book's available at Amazon. Of course, you can link on by going to our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Nancy, it's been a pleasure to have you on the program. Time has gone by way too quickly. and I knew Oh, my gosh. It, I knew it was <laughs> yes. going to, but we could spend a couple of hours talking about the, the impact this book is having and inspiration for adolescents, young adults, is everybody, especially at that point in their lives, trying to, to reach their dreams. It, it, it's so yeah. well done. Thank you for being with us on the program to, uh, to uh, share Sarah's story. Well, thank you for having me. It has been I our pleasure. It. it has been okay. a pleasure to have you here. Nancy Hussey, the book is Dancing Like There's No Tomorrow. You'll find it at Amazon. Link on directly by going to our website, thisweekinamerica.us. And we're back on today's program after these messages. This Week in America is online. You can visit our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Scott Pinkerton, associate producer of This Week in America. Jay Anderson, segment producer. Ben Watson, webmaster. Otto Bache, director of engineering and TV production. This Week in America produced and is a trademark of Blue Funk Broadcasting, LLC. 